Um, I'd like to introduce you. You probably know Dr. Andreas Schultz, who's the Centre Director of PMH, but um, if you don't know him, um, he'll introduce himself. Thank you. Um, infection is a very important part of cystic fibrosis, so it's worthwhile for everyone involved to try to know as much as they can about it. So thank you, Catherine, for arranging this seminar. Not on? Sorry, Our first speaker is um, Dr. Tony Kyle. Now, Tony is the head of um, Bath West and Microbiology at Princess Morgan Hospital. And Tony is the person that respiratory physicians at BMA should go to if they have questions about infection and, and specific um, uh, microbiology related issues. So I look forward to hear Tony speak on Ceremonus, where you can find it, and how does it remain on surfaces. Thanks, Andre. It's amazing how pervasive uh, the Cystic Fibrosis, uh, Fibrosis Association is. The other day I was exiting off on Vincent Street, uh, waiting by the lights, and sort of thinking, gosh, what am I going to sort of tell this group? And out of the corner of my right eye, uh, I don't know if the owner of the vehicle is here, but I saw this number plate, CF25 or 27, on a white SUV, and I thought, hang on, CF, that's what I'm talking about. Close for inspection, Cystic Fibrosis. <laughs> and I'm just parked outside to another white car, CF666 or something. So they're absolutely, you're everywhere and uh, all pervasive. So what I'm going to sort of cover here, it's always difficult to sort of pitch um, a presentation of a really quite complex sort of microbial ecology in the CF lung to, uh, well, don't want to disparage you sort of lay people, but lay people with a whole range of different sort of expertises. So I've got some incredibly basic stuff, and I make no apologies for that because it's on the basis of simple stuff that bigger things grow. But I've also sort of thrown in some of the very latest sexy stuff on sort of whole genome sequencing, metagenomics, etc., um, which I think is really going to be sort of quite illuminating in terms of individual sort of patients and their particular microbiome, which is a sort of buzzword, we've got the virome, etc. So to begin, we'll sort of talk about Microbiology 101. So men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and that's sort of the epitome of the dichotomy of life. And it's the same sort of thing in the bacterial world. Um, essentially, we have to sort of divide up bacterial species into di different types. And uh, like all sort of good Germans who have got sort of a fastidious attention to detail, um, here, Professor Graham, who was a sort of German microbiologist, devised a sort of staining uh, methodology that basically differentiates sort of bacteria into men and women, or in this case, if you take up the Gram stain reagent, you're considered a Gram positive organism, and if you don't take it up, you're considered a Gram negative um, organism. There's then sort of further differentiation actually based on the shape, where we look down the light microscope, if you're sort of a, uh, a gram organism that's sort of round shape, you can sort of call it a coccus. Um, there are different sorts of clumping of cocci. You can sort of be like uh, individual cocci strung together as a bunch of grapes. And that's characteristic of, say, a particular bacterial species called Staphoreus and all the other Staphylococci that sort of inhabit uh, humans. Or if you're sort of, you know, elongated and round shaped like a rod, then that's sort of a bacillus. So hence you have gram-positive cocci, you have gram-negative rods, you've got gram-positive rods, gram-negative cocci, etc. And that's really the sort of essential delineation of the microbial world, pretty well up until sort of you know, a decade or two ago when we started to get into the molecular stuff. Now, there's then further differentiation of these sorts of gram-positive cocci and rods based on a whole range of phenotypic reactions, enzymatic reactions, uh, production of sort of you know, pigments, etc., etc., all of which ultimately sort of derives um, us to sort of identify a particular species. And in a sense, this now is really, I mean, it's almost pathetic in, in how sort of simple it is, but the reality is, is that it's actually been the, the absolute bedrock of microbiology for sort of, for many, many years. So 
What we have, just to sort of give you a relative uh, um, scheme of things in terms of size, at the top is we've got sort of a streptococcus. And then we've got sort of by a limit of resolution, these are sort of the limit of resolution of light microscopy, sort of a thousand times oil immersion. Now, one of the interesting things is that we often talk about viruses affecting humans, but you have to realize that there's a whole community of viruses called bacteriophages that actually infect um, different particular bacterial species. And some of the microbiome and virome work that I'm going to allude to in the next few slides, what's now sort of become apparent is that whilst we sort of think of human respiratory viruses like influenza, etc., within the CF lung, there's this whole very large community of sort of these uh, bacteriophages, staphages, etc., that are actually infecting um, the sort of the uh, bacteriology, the bacterial species that live sort of in cystic fibrosis lungs. And the actual contribution and changes in the virome, these sort of viruses infecting the bugs, and their role in transmitting genetic elements from, say, one particular pseudomonas strain to another, I think is going to be one of these sort of, you know, watch this space um, areas in the next uh, five to ten years. So, what this is, this is a gram-positive coccus forming sort of clumps, quite characteristic of, uh, of Staph aureus. And then we have here a Pseudomonas organism, which is a gram-negative Coccobacillus. There's a 10 micrometer sort of, you know, marker there. So the normal length of these things is around about sort of, you know, one to two uh, micrometers. And that's important because when we sort of talk about um, the bacterial colonization of sort of surfaces, um, one of the things I try and impress upon people, I mean, yes, it's microbiology, so these are small things, but you have to realize that they're really quite incredibly small things. So if you had sort of a centimetre by a centimetre sort of surface area, and you covered it, uh, you know, with sort of a one micrometre sort of, you know, coccus, you're looking in the order of a thousand billion organisms per square centimetre, if it was sort of a uniform coverage. So that's a, a huge bacterial density. Although, to us, when we look at it, it'll look actually reasonably clean, okay? So, one of the um, if you like, fundamental tenets that I want to get across to you during this sort of presentation is that they're everywhere. Right? Microbes are absolutely everywhere at various densities. And you've got to be mindful of that when you're sort of talking about risks relating to environmental exposure and what you can sort of do to try and minimise it. This is another sort of gram negative coccus, so Haemophilus influenzae. Okay, so it's a shame that it's not really coming across in terms of the lights. But this is a, a classic culture of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. One of the things is, is that Pseudomonas does produce a pyocyanin pigment, which is sort of a characteristic sort of yellowy sort of green that also fluoresces under UV light. It's uh, one of the components to sort of um, the colour of pus, nice green pus. If it's loaded with pseudomonas, it's actually due to the production of the pigment and to a lesser extent, the myelate peroxidase enzyme that's present in white blood cells uh, that sort of fight the infection. So, um, sadly, in some individuals with chronic vascular disease who have chronic sort of leg ulcers colonised heavily with pseudomonas, it's not unusual to have a particular sort of green metallic sheen, which is actually the growth of these organisms at very high concentrations on the ulcer surface. There are two main sort of, if you like, phenotypes of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. One is what we call the normal sort of, you know, dry type, which is actually, can't sort of see it too well here, this just sort of illustrates the green pigment. But the other sort of phenotype is the production of an exopolysaccharide uh, mucus um, in huge sort of quantities. And here you can sort of see, this might just be from a single colony forming unit of Pseudomonas, but it tends to produce quite thick and heavy sort of, you know, mucoid uh, colonies. And that's obviously one of the major sort of particular concerns in terms of pseudomonas and CF lung disease. Okay, now, sadly, well, not sadly, in order to sort of give you a bit of an idea of uh, bacterial contamination, um, this paper actually compared um, mean bacterial levels on household surfaces. And uh, sadly for the Cambodians, it sort of compared um, bacterial load in a Cambodian household and sort of compared that with a uh, United States household. 
Now, this isn't a, a, a bad reflection on Cambodia, it's just sort of a reflection of a third world country. But the point that I, I want to make is that uh, um, in terms of here where we have sort of, you know, fecal coliforms, the actual counts are relatively low, say 3 to 10 uh, per sort of square centimetre. But the total sort of, you know, bacterias and, uh, bacterial count can actually sort of be quite high. You know, 35,000 plus per square centimetre on a sink faucet handle, countertop around about sort of 300, um, surface cutting board, you know, 10,000 or so, toilet flush handle. Interestingly, toilet flush handle is not as bad as a sink faucet handle, so what do you have to do? So that's interesting. And floor surface, so um, around the base of the toilet, a couple of thousand. Can be about sort of within Cambodia where there's generally sort of an order of magnitude or two but magnitudes higher. The point of the slide is to indicate that the bugs are absolutely everywhere and the bacterial load that you actually have with these organisms sometimes doesn't necessarily sort of gel with what you think might be the highest risk areas. In fact, the toilet may not be so bad, they're saying it's sort of sink forces. This is look of looking at it again, sort of, you know, different sort of bacterial uh, levels, this time also including sort of Japan. And the critical thing here is to sort of indicate in the dark colours that uh, 10,000 and above sort of colony forming units per uh, square centimetre. And essentially, wherever you sort of look, um, what we sort of call things that have inanimate, things that have the potential to transmit bacteria in the environment are called fomites. So fomites like the side of the, you know, dripping uh, ladle for the sink, basins, etc. All of these have relatively high sort of colony counts of bacteria. So the point, again, that I'm just making is the normal sort of environment that we all live in is laden with bacteria. Mostly non-pathogenic bacteria, but nevertheless, they're laden with bacteria. So that sort of deals with the environment, but what's sort of the microbial load that we actually have in humans. Now, depending upon which part of the skin you surface, if I was sort of, sort of take a square centimetre of the back of my hand or around the elbow, I'd be looking at probably around about 100 to 1,000 uh, so-called colony forming units per square centimetre. Now, if I was actually sample to sample around my anus, I would probably have absolutely much higher counts as would any of us. If we look at the mouth, very high density of sort of bacterial populations, often of quite disparate sort of species, but there we're sort of looking at at least 10 of the 6 to 10 of the 7. So 1 million, 10 million, and in these sort of gingival crevicular spaces where there's quite complex microbial communities, in fact, in some respect they sort of parallel the complex microbial communities that we have in CF1, you can have in the order of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9. The stomach, despite sort of receiving a whole whack of food that might be contaminated, principally because of the acid within the stomach has got quite low bacterial counts in the order of only about sort of 10 to 100 per mil. Whereas the faeces, um, you know, you're looking at around about 100 billion plus uh, per gram. <coughs> now, how much faeces does an individual have? Well, if you're trying to lose weight and you do a big number two, you hope there's a lot of weight in the faeces that sort of line up the body. But in the order of, say, you know, probably maybe one to two kilos of faeces, the large intestine receives in excess of nine litres of sort of fluid from the small intestine. So your gut um, contains a huge, absolutely huge reservoir of uh, uh, microbes. Um, what about pus? Good pus. 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 per mil. But the really interesting thing is, uh, and you don't sort of necessarily think about it, but sputum, there's two ways of sort of determining the microbial load within sputum. One is sort of the total viable count. And this is where we look at all the different bacterial species that are present in sputum and then sort of enumerate them. And generally, depending upon underlying uh, lung conditions, chronic infections, etc., the sorts of ranges of bacterial load that we see are between 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 12 per mil. So 10 to the 12, that's actually quite a substantial heavy load. And the upper estimates of the load now have really been sort of derived from uh, molecular biological means of determining what particular species are present and how much of those species are present in sputum. If we break it down, how much of that sort of total viable count is actually pseudomonas probably varies from 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 11. So the point being is that there is a huge quantity 
of microbes present within sort of sputum. Now, the, the intriguing thing is, is that um, previously when we were sort of looking at the normal ways of identifying bacterial load, plating it out, growing on a plate, doing serum dilutions, counting individual colonies to coming up with a number, we now realise again that that's really quite a, well, I just sort of say that it is a pretty pathetic underestimation of how complex the actual sputum microbiology is. And using the more modern molecular detection methods, whole genome sequencing, whole sequencing of the entire sort of microbiome in sputum, this is where we're now getting up to 10 to 11, 10 to the 12 total counts of, of bacteria. So, uh, a little bit of the sexy stuff, just sort of published earlier this year. I'm sure you all read the journal of Cystic Fibrosis. This included contributions from an Australian author, Dana Wilmer, from sort of Queensland. And essentially, there's this sort of technique called metagenomics and metatranscriptomics. Now, metagenomics is where we look at the DNA, and metatranscriptomics is where we want to look at the expression of bacterial RNA. In other words, what are the bugs actually generating in terms of proteins necessary for cellular metabolism and growth? So, don't want to get too much into the detail, but there are some sort of interesting things. What this slide shows is they took a number of patients and actually sort of sampled their total sputum microbiota, um, you know, during an exacerbation, whilst they were on treatment, and then sort of, you know, post-treatment. And basically, um, ignore a lot of the stuff there, but the thing is, is that by using metagenomics now, we're able to characterise a vast range of different bacterial species, some of which can be particularly technically uh, difficult and fastidious to grow and enumerate correctly. The point being, really, is here you just need to note that there are differences during the exacerbation with how much bacterial load of a respective bacterial species there is during treatment, antibiotic effects, changing the relative balance, and then sort of post-treatment, you know, restoration of sort of pre-treatment <coughs> loads and other sort of changes. And all of this can sort of be expressed sort of quite nicely and graphically. Again, here we have on sort of the left, exacerbation, the percentage of the total bacterial um, sequence um, of a particular sort of, you know, bacterial species here, representing different colours. Then you're on treatment, and then you're sort of post-treatment. So the point here is, is that actually the, the total microbial environment of the cystic fibrosis lung undergoes dramatic changes in terms of the relative proportion of bacterial species, some of which we just haven't identified by conventional sort of phenotypic or growing mechanisms. The other thing, though, is that post-treatment, there are then sort of restoration back to sort of, you know, pre-treatment situations, um, or slightly different. But uh, this type of technique, I can absolutely assure you, is incredibly exciting. And uh, it's really indicating that a lot of these sort of statements that we sort of came up with in terms of cystic fibrosis microbiology tend to sort of break down a, a bit when we're looking at individual patients' microbiome and the change that they have in their particular sort of, you know, mix and match of bacterial species. Now, this is um, a study, interestingly, the same sort of method of totally analysing um, all DNA, microbial DNA in the environment. This was a paper that sort of mad researchers transited through um, New York subway stations and sampled cubic metres of air circulating in the subway stations. They then um, totally analysed all of the microbial DNA and effectively sort of, you know, broke it down into the various bacterial sort of, you know, species that we see. The point that I want to reiterate is along this sort of top axis here are the various um, individual sort of New York subway stations. But um, the one thing is here is that, and these sort of, you know, numbers and the colours represent, in a sense, the, the quantity of how much of a particular bacterial species DNA that they found. Now, within the New York subway system, you can imagine the number of humans that transit and traffic it, and humans basically shed human skills, uh, skin cells. And skin cells are loaded with um, staphylococci. 
coagulase negative staphylococci, normal flora, staph aureus, normal flora, and occasionally be a pathogen. The point being is though, is that staphylococcus was found pretty well absolutely everywhere, and then a whole range of other sort of genera, including their sort of cinnabonus. So the point that I'm making here is, is that even in sort of relatively inert New York subways, there's a huge density of microbes that are out there circulating freely in the air. And this is just sort of looking at bacterial species. It's not sort of looking at fungal species as well. So just to reiterate the point, bugs are absolutely everywhere. So one of the things I've been asked to sort of talk about is bacterial survival in the environment. So there's a, a couple of broad um, factors uh, that determine this. <clears throat> I mean, the environment, as we know, it is sort of relatively toxic. And although bacteria sort of, you know, can double, and E. coli can sort of double every 20 minutes in the right sort of, you know, medium, <clears throat> staphylococci less so, but there's this inexorable balance between growth and multiplication and death just due to environmental factors. So if I've got a million bugs um, sort of colonising a particular area, there's going to be obviously a far greater length of survival of those organisms over time than if there are only sort of 10 or 1,000. So it's important when one's sort of talking about ways of trying to minimise bacterial load, that if in fact you can sort of by regular cleaning, whether or not you use disinfectants, we'll talk about that later, but a regular sort of physical cleaning action can decrease the microbial load on surfaces, and by doing that, effectively, the chance of having high bacterial load contamination is reduced significantly. There's also presence of other bacteria. I mean, you know, humans have wars, bacteria have wars. They sort of produce toxins and stuff that'll be, you know, detrimental to sort of other particular species, but not knock off, say, gram-positive organisms. Humidity is important, and I'll sort of show you some cartoons about the structure of bugs to explain that. <coughs> Looking at temperature, generally the warmer things are, the faster metabolic processes happen, and so the faster degradation happens in killing. Temperature, pH, you know, how acid, how alkali, ultraviolet exposure, sunlight, fantastic. Basically breaks down sort of DNA, uh, the bonds between DNA, and effectively stops any sort of bacterial DNA replication. But the point is, is that for the UV to work, it's actually got to get to the microbe. And if there's a lot of other junk, okay, in sort of contamination of surfaces, other sort of protein, like let's say a good 50 microliter dollop of sputum, 10 of the 7, 10 of the 8 bugs, lots of mucus, lots of you know, host white blood cells, then even though that might be sort of exposed to the environment in terms of UV exposure, the UV is not getting to the DNA, so it can't damage it. And then the presence of other biological materials, and they really sort of provide niches for the sort of growth and maintenance of this. But as a general rule, gram-positive <coughs> bugs are more um, hardy than gram-negative bugs, and the reason for that is that gram-negatives have a uh, more complex cell structure. This is just sort of highlighting the sort of the range of pH. And probably the most important thing here is to realise that uh, bugs have actually got a pretty broad range, you know, from 4 to sort of, you know, 9 and up to sort of 10 or 11, depending upon the organism. So the normal sorts of pH ranges that are in the environment generally don't present a barrier for an organism growth and survival. So what are some of the survival things that we're looking at? Well, it's incredibly uh, technically dependent, obviously, how much you put on, you know, the frequency of sampling, the environment, post sort of, you know, putting the stuff on and seeing how long it lasts for. But Staph aureus, a gram-positive organism, at an absolute minimum on a bench top with a small inoculum, say, 100 to 1,000 colony-forming units in total, no other biological material, you'll get at least 72 plus hours, possibly longer. A toothbrush. Now remember sort of the microbial um, load that I mentioned before in sort of, you know, mouth and saliva, and the cravicular fluids, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 plus. So a toothbrush, um, once you finish using it, is absolutely loaded with uh, sort of bacteria. And hence we can recover, you know, organisms up to 24 hours, if not beyond. But there's one important sort of caveat that can sort of decrease bacterial load, and that's the presence of detergent. Now, I make sort of mention here, just purely as an illustrative example of Colgate Total. 
Our coal gate total actually contains triclosan, which is the active antimicrobial moiety. And it sort of acts a bit like a, a, a detergent as well as having direct antimicrobial properties. But coal gate total um, is quite effective. Two to three log reduction, so that's 100 times to 1,000 times um, better killing compared to no sort of toothpaste in terms of knocking off sort of these um, oral bacteria. So, why is this so? Well, how come detergents are bad for folks, especially gram negative ones? Well, it really relates to sort of the fundamental complexity of gram negative organisms. Gram negative organisms, in a sense, came in the hierarchical sort of evolutionary structure a little bit after gram positives, and they acquired this sort of second outer membrane. Now, on that sort of top row, you can't sort of, you know, see it uh, in this sort of cartoon. That's how far my mouse, yeah. But in between here, you've got uh, sort of divalent cations, magnesium and calcium, etc., that hold basically the gram-negative outer cell membrane together. Now, if you throw a detergent at that, the detergent, by basically sort of having a long sort of chain, is able to sort of embed itself in this outer membrane and basically destroys it. And once that happens, that physical barrier to sort of antibiotics, etc., and cell integrity is removed. So essentially, the gram-negative organism just bursts, lyses, and dies. Whereas if you look at a gram-positive organism on the left now, again, it's got this sort of cell membrane structure, but it's got this incredibly thick cell wall. And it's really that presence of cell wall, in particular, tycharic acids and lipotycharic acid moieties, peptidoglycan, etc., that actually contribute to why gram-positive organisms a substantially more environmental hardy, a greater resistance to a whole range of stuff. So, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. They're two totally different things at the sort of physical level. So what about some more data? Again, um, using reasonably significant bacterial inoculants here and looking at sort of different surfaces. Uh, vinyl flooring versus ceramic tiles. Now, the, this table here shows the survival duration in days, right? not hours, sort of days. So we look here for Staph aureus, 63 days, two months. You know, remaining viable on a vinyl floor and a ceramic tile. Particular issue right now in Royal Perth, why is Royal Perth having a particular problem with vancomycin-resistant enterococci, or VRE? Well, I've just got to see here. Vinyl flooring, ceramic tile survival is 47.8 days, 67.8 days. Now, the reality of being sort of in a tertiary hospital environment is that it can be pretty difficult to sort of have an absolutely immaculate cleaning regimen. So you'll end up, you know, the elderly patient has bad diarrhea, squirts all over the place, gets on the commode, intestines are loaded with VRE. So you end up with substantial environmental contamination with VRE. And even though patient care assistants and cleaners, etc., do their utmost best to sort of get a good macroscopic clean, so you're not putting your hand in dollops of poo, the problem is it's all at a microscopic level. So it'll look immaculate, but the bugs are still there. They'll be in the crevices and the grout, etc., etc. So when Royal Perth had their original VRE outbreak about 10 years ago, there was a massive involvement, you know. You had dedicated VRE cleaning teams, but all they did was just go around and just specialise in cleaning patient accommodation. Nowadays, we know that, that even if you have multiple teams that are using complex toxic elements, you still don't necessarily kill the bugs. And when Charlie's um, had a VRE issue not so long ago, they had basically brought in gas fumigation type schemes to sort of bomb fumigate individual patient rooms. Fantastic technology. Gas permeates everywhere, kills off everything. But the critical thing is, is you still need to have a good clean. Because if you've got VRE or other organisms living within a sort of a dollop of dried poo, you can have as much gas as you like, but it's not going to get in there and kill off the stuff. Again, I'm just sort of highlighting the bugs are everywhere, widespread environmental contamination is really the norm. And when we sort of look at other sort of, you know, workbench covering materials like laminex, okay, again, months. So, not to sort of really 
get into much uh, intense detail about this. But the factors affecting survival on surfaces, well, if you're gram positive versus gram negative, you tend to do better if you're gram positive. The relative humidity in terms of maintaining your cellular structure, content temperature, etc. And it's the same sort of thing with regard to sort of aerosols. Now, aerosols are important in uh, sort of the transmission of microorganisms. Basically, there's a whole range of different sizes of aerosols that are sort of generated when an individual coughs. Some can be particularly small, you know, under one to two microns, and they're sort of suspended in the air by sort of ground air motion. And these things can sort of float around quite happily for maybe many metres and cause a problem. But those particular aerosols are generally incredibly low in terms of the bacterial density. Because if they had lots of bugs, it'd be too heavy, and then they'd sort of settle. So you have the situation where we have small particle aerosols, which are a major problem in terms of transmitting particular viruses, like measles and chickenpox. Measles is the most communicable sort of disease known to man, worse than Ebola, worse than Marburg. You know, you could have an individual uh, with active measles in an emergency department, an ambulance driver walking through the department five metres away for no more than five minutes, transiting the department can sort of get measles. So incredibly infectious through these small particle aerosols. But in the context of CF bacterial transmission, respiratory mucus droplets are relatively large, and the usual maxim is, is that the maximum distance that they can sort of spread from an individual is about a metre. Now, there is other work to suggest in experimental conditions that these large particle respiratory droplets can spread for more than a metre, probably no more than two metres, and certainly in experimental scenarios, further than that. But the actual contribution of those sort of large particle respiratory droplets, even though we can identify them a fair way away, their actual contribution to sort of spreading infection is really quite debated. And currently the Infectious Diseases Society of America, combined with the Cystic Fibrosis Association, are reworking infection control guidelines, looking at is one metre exclusion enough, should we be going for two metres, three metres or whatever. And so we just need to watch this space. <coughs> okay, so how do we actually acquire bacteria? Well, we've got to remember that uh, we are sort of part of the great big humanome, if you like, you know. That's what we're about. Born as kids, babies, hugs by mum and dad, siblings, etc. So the number one way that we actually acquire bugs is by direct contact, person-to-person -person acquisition. All of these other things, indirect contact from fomites, contaminated environments, do play a role, but the actual magnitude of that role is really difficult to quantitate. So a lot of experts spend a lot of time pontificating, gesticulating, um, hypothesizing. The bottom line is, is that we'll never really know the relative contribution. But in my mind, direct contact person to person is probably the most important. And we can sort of see this. This is uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation uh, patient registry data, their annual report in 2010. And essentially, those that are part of the human existence, Staph aureus, um, the gram negative Coccobacillus haemophilus influenzae, which is a normal respiratory tract, sort of, you know, common soil, can also sort of, you know, cause infections. These are the sorts of bugs that all humans have, especially adults. So it's not surprising when we sort of look at, if you like, these big ticket bacterial species, Staph aureus, Haemophilus influenzae, and the age at which they sort of become apparent, that it's the Staph aureus and the Haemophilus influenzae, the bugs that are normally found on other humans, that we see sort of represented in, you know, the sort of early um, age cohorts, right? It's unusual to actually see the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, to sort of, you know, see the MRSAs, although now, sadly, MRSA is increasingly prevalent in the normal community. 10 to 15% of people will be colonised with MRSA. So if you're an adult and you're colonised with it, hence you can sort of transmit it onto your kid. But the thing to note is that environmental organisms, and we sort of talk about Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is gram-negative rod. 
It's got a particular characteristic in terms of its metabolism. It's called a non-fermenter. Okay, it doesn't sort of ferment sugars. Basically, it can sort of derive energy for growth from um, organic compounds like acetate and other things, the nitrogen, so from amines. So this is why pseudomonas can grow in water, because these sort of essential compounds are dissolved in it, throw in a bit of oxygen, and pseudomonas is in happy heaven. But these sort of gram-negative non-fermenters, things like sort of pseudomonas aeruginosa, okay, stenotrophomonas maltophilia, the Burkhardt-Eri cepacea complex, and the acromobacters, these are sort of environmental organisms with a low rate of acquisition by patients, but clearly the older you go, the increased likelihood of cumulative exposure will lead to you becoming infected and sort of colonised. So there's a lot of proposed mechanisms for why there is a particular issue with sort of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, won't sort of go into these uh, in sort of detail, but it always leads to wonderful cartoons. Um, and I just sort of show this as an illustrative example. CF, uh, you know, respiratory epithelium. The organism here with its various sort of attachment factors forming sort of little micro aggregation complexes um, on sort of, you know, the respiratory epithelium. And then by a whole range of host interactions with itself, with the environment, uh, presence of, you know, particular uh, proteins and uh, chemicals, migration from sort of a small little microcluster into a, a characteristic pseudomonas biofilm, right? Very dense, complex microbial community. So, am I going for time? Right. So, I was emailed um, the sorts of things that Tony, <coughs> we get asked about from parents. And these are some of the things. What is the risk of exposure to swimming pools, change rooms, shower forces, water, da 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 da? Now, I'm not going to address every single one of these in detail, but I am going to address a couple to sort of to give you a flavour for if you're like trying to sort of have some sensible risk management approach to uh, you know dealing with the acquisition of, of you know bugs, pseudomonas from the environment. So what is the risk to see of patients from swimming pools and change rooms? Okay. Well, remember Pseudomonas, very uh, sort of, you know, simple, is able to essentially use um, elemental uh, chemicals for carbon and nitrogen source combined with oxygen. So basically it will grow anywhere, but especially where there's water and inanimate objects. But determining how much load of Pseudomonas aeruginosa you have in these environments clearly depends upon what are some of the other mechanisms that are being done to control bugs. So you go to a commercial swimming pool, your home pool, you throw in chlorine. Right? Chlorine quite effectively knocks off pseudomonas. Depends upon the chlorine level, clearly, how often you sort of apply it as an automated system. In terms of, let's say, jacuzzis and spa pools, there's quite complex um, sort of hydraulics and plumbing associated with those spa pools. Lots of dead ends, Lots of areas where water can sort of, you know, essentially be trapped. And the chlorine that might be present sort of in the household water supply, possibly at a one part per million level, after sort of eight hours or so essentially evaporates. And you then end up with sort of water in the particular U-bend of the jacuzzi or whirlpool, um, essentially not having any antimicrobial activity. Pseudomonas forms a biofilm and effectively is there forever. So the state of the infrastructure of these sorts of systems is particularly important, primarily because of the presence of biofilms. And biofilms present significant resistance to antimicrobial activity. So even though you might sort of treat the system, until you can actually physically remove the biofilms, any suppression of growth is usually transitory. And within a day or two, the whole sort of bacterial load in that system becomes repopulated from sort of the sessile bacteria present in sort of biofilms. Decks, drains, benches, etc. cetera, moist environment. Pseudomonas can grow quite happily up to 41, 42 degrees centigrade. So they'll be sort of growing in that sort of environment as well. So it's one thing to sort of talk about the growth of these organisms, but how common is it? So Switzerland, you know, very clean, very good environment, lots of sort of rigorous adhesion 
just sort of public health standards in terms of adding chlorine and appropriate levels. A study there found Pseudomonas in 4 to 7% of swimming pool water. Okay. In Northern Ireland, similar study done, 38%. I don't know if that was during the global financial crisis or whatever, but it illustrates that one. Whirlpools and jacuzzis. Now, I've got to say, if, if you're looking for ground zero in terms of microbial risk, then a private jacuzzi or whirlpool bath um, is, is right up there. Because the study shows 70% plus uh, levels, significant levels of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, whether these environmental Pseudomonas aeruginosa strains actually result in a productive infection, um, difficult. Probably they do. The actual magnitude of contribution, though, difficult to assess. But if you're like other sort of hot wall bathing, um, for example, in Iceland, depending upon the number of people that hop into the hot pool with you, right, you'll have pseudomonas levels 150 to 400 per mil. And the other bad news about geothermal pools is you have these other sort of, you know, gorgeous folks, atypical uh, environmental mycobacteria. And this is where they live. So mycobacterium abscesses. So in short, um, jacuzzis, uh, whirlpool baths, spa pools, etc., especially in a private context, private home, have got to be sus. And uh, you might know, in sort of commercial environments in hotels, if they're running sort of, you know, hot water spa baths and pools, um, their sort of sampling frequency to maintain adequate chlorine levels is either hourly or two hourly in order to sort of ensure that they don't drop down. This just sort of shows uh, some real world um, stuff. Looking at uh, sort of, you know, Pseudomonas positive, this one particular hot tub bath, you know, 100%. Fortunately, the fair numbers uh, were clear. Here we go, a major swimming pool, you know, 1 million litres. 25% of those, yeah, pseudomonas, etc. So the problem is, is that again, pseudomonas is everywhere. So what about hay, mulch, sort of veggie patches, and horse exposure? Yeah, that was another example that was given to me. Well, I sort of, you know, scoured PubMed as we all do, trying to sort of, you know, link hay and pseudomonas, and surprisingly, didn't sort of find much at all. But I would certainly expect it to be there, um, and. It's probably not so much Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but other environmental Pseudomonas and these other non-fermenters that are present. And they're especially high bacterial counts if, you know, hay is mouldy, just because of moisture and degradation. The big thing, though, with hay is sort of fungi and moulds, and in particular, aspergillus species. We're all familiar with aspergillus causing allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, etc. The spore count of aspergillus in the air depends you can have up to sort of 15,000 individual spores per cubic metre. The amount of spores in here, we're probably looking at 150 to 200 aspergillus spores per cubic metre. In the hospital operating room environment, we'd be probably looking at less than five aspergillus spores per cubic metre. But the point is, is you can't get away from them. They're, they're everywhere. And you factor in the total sort of volume of air that sort of you know, gets inhaled and exhaled, in terms of cubic metres, your exposure to aspergillus is guaranteed. Um, whether or not it causes a problem, you know, is due to a whole bunch of other factors. The problem with these fungal spores is that the normal upper airway filtering mechanisms, okay, that keep out the large gulps of gunk, right, aren't too good at these very small particles. Two to three microns can sort of get right down deep within lung parenchyma. There's also the risk of Legionella species. I mean, there's not a lot done about CF patients and risk, say, to Legionella, but certainly Legionella species are found in potting mix, mulch, etc. So if you're engaging in those sorts of activities, hay exposure, etc., my recommendation is you should seriously think about using an appropriate uh, mask protection, either P1 or P2 level, during sort of the periods when you're at that greatest risk, and especially if that's sort of prolonged activity. Well, what about horses? Well, in short, there is no real risk. This was a study that looked at uh, the occurrence of the Liverpool uh, epidemic strain in sort of, you know, horses, and in short, they didn't sort of find any. Um, but nevertheless, horses are uh, in a relatively heavy microbial load, covered in dust, roll on the ground, etc. 
So perhaps if you're undertaking brushing of your horse, maybe you should wear a mask. Has there been hard data to indicate clear transmission from horse to a CF uh, patient? No. But it might be sort of a good idea, especially if you're engaging in some pretty intense uh, exposure to microbes, like in mucking out. Interestingly, where we do sort of find pseudomonas in horses is in the urogenital system. So 46% of horses will have pseudomonas in their urine. So if you're mucking out stables with horse urine and everything else, you could well come across horse equine pseudomonas strains. Will they infect you? We don't know. But it's a sort of perhaps a prudent measure to think about, you know, what is going to be your risk in sort of undertaking normal animal, animal husbandry activities. And we can sort of apply this to sort of, you know, keeping birds, you know, the, the detritus on the underneath of the bird cage, or, you know, walking into a bird cage where they're all fluttering around or keeping chooks. They're going to create large particles of aerosols, heavily contaminated with environmental bacteria and fungi. So probably, well, again, there's no hard evidence, but you could sort of make the argument that taking some form of respiratory protection might be a wise thing. What about shower heads? Well, shower heads definitely have sort of grown pseudomonas. There have been outbreaks linked um, to shower heads as a reservoir for Legionella and hospital patients acquiring it. And similarly, pseudomonas species colonising shower heads um, have been found and reported. This is a case example here. And when they sort of looked at the breakdown, um, catheter grew pseudomonas, blood culture grew pseudomonas, shower room one, isolated pseudomonas, 800 CFUs per 100 ml. So that was relatively low, only 8 CFUs per ml pseudomonas. Hot water, again, pseudomonas does grow sort of in relatively warm temperatures, much higher growth. And the, the other thing too, sort of shower room two, etc. And this is a hospital environment. Now, we're very much fixated in the hospital environment on Legionella, and I can't tell you at Princess Margaret, for example, what our shower head colonisation rate with pseudomonas is. Now, what are some of the things that are going to probably affect high levels of pseudomonas contamination of shower heads? Well, if a shower head isn't used that often, say not daily, maybe only once or twice a week, then you're going to have stagnant water and relatively warm water after its last use. So you can well postulate that infrequently used showers and shower heads are going to probably um, result in some significant bacterial contamination. But whether that actually translates to infection, that's sort of a bit unclear. Fortunately, shower use in most tertiary hospitals of such sufficient frequency that uh, things are relatively stable. But this was a study looking at the environment of uh, CF patients in a, a German, um, uh, you know, uh, tertiary hospital environment, and again, before the first shower, they looked at the number of uh, samples in the air and the surfaces, and uh, fortunately, before the first shower, um, so where things were relatively dormant, there was no water around, didn't recover pseudomonas. After the patient shower, within the air, Staph aureus, and then on surfaces, pseudomonas originosa. Now, you could well argue, could that pseudomonas originosa have come from a coughing person? Quite possible, but more likely is the sort of contamination of the surfaces from pseudomonas colonising shower heads. So, what about vases and fish tanks? Well, there are definitely very high counts of you know bacteria, including pseudomonas and other environmental gram negatives, atypical mycobacteria um, from these sorts of uh, environments. But this is where you just need to take a bit of a reality check. Flowers in a vase, just sitting there in water, I mean, aesthetically they're lovely, but the bugs aren't sort of jumping out and going sort of 10 feet or somebody to infect somebody. So as long as they're just sort of sitting there, and with a sort of the caveat in the fish tank, if you've got sort of an aerator creating bubbles, as the bubbles come to the surface, they sort of explode. If you don't have a cover, theoretically, you can have generational micro aerosols from those bubbles exploding and being contaminating the environment. And if you're there as a kid sort of staring in, looking for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, there's a potential risk there. But the point what I want to say is, is that generally there are no active aerosols being sort of generated. So the real potential risk is not by these things just sort of being there. It's actually when you disturb that sort of environment. So changing the fish tank water, 
gurgle, 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 you know, pouring it down, taking out the flowers, pouring out the water, splashing into the sink. That's going to be generating lots of splashes, destruction of the biofilms, and lots of bacteria. But will they actually infect you? <coughs> Who knows? Air conditioners? Well, the potential risk here really does depend upon the type. We know that it's less so with, re with refrigerated systems, as long as there's adequate drainage of sort of the uh, water condensate. So if you don't have adequate drainage, you could find that the condensate drip tray underneath the mere sort of you know, air outflow could have a one to two centimetre layer of water that then becomes you know, heavily contaminated with bugs and potentially acts as a reservoir. Where we do know that there is a far greater risk is with the so-called evaporative um, air coolers or air conditioners. Water is added to the tank, often with no sort of microbiocides added. It's a relatively warm environment because we're using air coolers in a hot sort of, you know, it's 40 degree per summer day. So biofilms form. Even if the tank dries out, the bacteria remain viable. You add some fresh water and then the whole sort of biofilm colonisation of the water and then potential sort of, you know, spreading of these um, aerosols in the environment into you is possible. And there's this entity sort of called humidifier fever, principally in sort of North American and European climates in winter where the air is quite dry, so they, you know, put in humidifiers. And what happens there, four to 24 hours after you turn on your humidifier, you get a lot of fever, chills, headache, general malaise and other symptoms. And what's thought to happen there is bacterial biofilms and exotoxins and stuff uh, interact with you. You either have an allergic response or a direct toxic effect of these things on you and you develop this clinical syndrome. So air conditioners, especially evaporative and humidifiers, just got to be a bit cautious about. Now, what about pseudomonas and salt? Well, we're all sort of familiar with you know, the salt therapies that are being sort of used in terms of uh, nebulized. This is just sort of looking at uh, how much salt you actually do need to kill off pseudomonas. <coughs> and in short, so I'll get the mouse up here, there's a whole range of different sort of bacterial species in the different color, <coughs> and different pseudomonas originosa strains. But the bottom line is um, certainly at 7%, you don't get any pseudomonas originosa growth, as long as the concentration remains at 7% where the pseudomonas are. Lower concentrations, like 3.5%, will be strain dependent. And this is completely separate to the effects of saline in terms of producing better sort of you know, mucus quality and then sort of the aid that that has of a better mucociliary sort of clearance of pseudomonas from the lung. Now, what is the risk, say for salt generators or salt mines or whatever else? Well, unless you're actually achieving concentrations where the pseudomonas is at sort of 4 to 7 percent, 4 percent minimum, and 7 percent ideally, you're not going to have really any effect at all on pseudomonas colonization numbers. Now, I'm not going to answer this, but I'm just going to finish off. If you remember, folks, there are bugs everywhere. It's not a sterile environment. But uh, if you sort of apply some basic principles in terms of the likelihood and density of the bugs, you can at least try and sort of come up with a framework, as well as speaking with you know your clinicians that are involved in your day-to-day -day management, people like Andre. If Andre doesn't know the answer, which would be exceptional, he'll give me a buzz, and then we can sort of you know nut out some sort of you know relative risk assessment and a schema by which you know day-to-day -day life activities that all of us want to do, enjoy doing, love doing, you can actually sort of do them without too much of a risk. So I thank you for your time, and has anybody got any other questions? <laughs> yes, at the back. I have a couple of questions. Um, one regarding cleaning. Um, you've got the disinfectants with still 99.9%, or you've got your just your basic hot so you water. Which one would you recommend, or are they each much? <coughs> Well, the thing uh, you have to be very wary of is 99.9% .9 kill. Okay, so that basically means, and remember, in terms of a microbial organism, if you have one, 
um, and that's switched on, you'll then have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, etc. So exponential growth. So a 99.9% .9 kill, that means if you've got um, 1,000 bugs, you'll have 999 that get knocked off, but there'll be one there. So if you've got 10,000 bugs, you'll end up with sort of, you know, 10 left, and conversely. So depending upon your bacterial load, whether it's 99.9% .9 kill or a 99.99% kill, if you've got a significant bacterial load, um, whether you use a detergent or something else, probably won't sort of change things uh, materially in the end. But it's clear that what is absolutely essential is a way of trying to sort of minimise the initial sort of bacterial load. And that's why I think the maxim should always be appropriate cleaning wherever possible, okay? And then, especially in regard to pseudomonas, if you can, appropriate drying of whatever you've cleaned. So let's say, take for example, respiratory therapy equipment. Yeah. Now, very heavily sort of contaminated <coughs> with the bacteria. The critical thing there is actually appropriate washing. You just sort of even soak it <coughs> if you've got nothing else to try and get rid of as much of the biological load as, as possible and then combine that with adequate drying yes. so that really um, the minimal, you've got a minimal amount of load that's there and any bugs that are there are basically finding it a difficult scenario to replicate because A, it's not wet and B, the bacterial numbers are low. So in short, the actual contribution of detergents and sort of microbiocides to um, sort of a general cleaning approach um, at best, it is probably not necessary. Might give you a little bit more um, insurance. It's clearly important in critical environments like in hospitals, yeah. where we're dealing with sort of low but definite risks of transmission, where that extra little bit of kill can be materially important. But for the general use in a home environment, um, I won't say you're pouring your money down the drain, but if you're relying on the microbiocides etc. to do the work and not doing an appropriate cleaning beforehand, um, you've probably no better off. Okay. And um, with regarding going to a gym, what's the likelihood of catching pseudomonas or such Yeah, look, uh, um, certainly we can find pseudomonas, we can find fungal spores pretty well, pretty well everywhere. So, so the chance... The gym, so should you be more... Um, more likely to like clean everything down before you use it? Look again, the person that's used it before, um, whether they're actively excreting bucket loads of pseudomonas is, is an interesting point. Possibly may not be, but they may be sort of depositing a whole range of other sort of, you know, skin cells laden with, you know, skin bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, certainly cleaning down common touched areas you know, would minimise the bacterial load that you're exposed to. Conversely, um, as long as you're reasonably prudent with hand hygiene, if you sort of practice appropriate hand hygiene in that sort of environment after sort of touching and contacting potentially contaminated equipment, that might be to the same efficacy as wiping down equipment before you actually use it. Okay. Whether doing both materially increases your level of protection Again, we just we just don't know. Sadly, we just really don't know. Yes. I'm just wondering about surf club and boating and um, you know, kids in the ocean, that sort of thing. Um, what I mean, frequently, you know, they'll get you know, they get dumped and they inhale water and all that yeah. stuff. What do you think yeah. about salt water, ocean water? Uh, well, salt water is so seawater. Is running at a salt content to around about sort of three three point five percent. So relatively high. In fact, the whole basis of salt therapy was now the Australian surface, etc. Um, when you actually sample salt water for bacteria, it's relatively free. There are what we call um, halophilic organisms, salt-loving organisms uh, that can be found. Um, Pseudomonas isn't necessarily one of those. Things like Vibrio species are. But again, that's incredibly uncommon. Where we do find salt water um, having reasonable degrees of bacterial load is next to sewerage outflows. Okay, so that then relates to the direct, you know, basically food burden in the water from the outflow. But you know, if you go to a beach, you know, in Perth anywhere in Australia, 
not next to a sewage outflow, the chances of you being exposed to any degree of significant bacterial load through swimming um, is effectively zero. Yes. Again, when you uh, finish having a shower and you talked about the warm environment yeah. and the bugs growing, um, to run cold water through the shower um, at the end until the shower is actually cooled, would that help with the reduction? Look, uh, on first principles, uh, possibly it would, um, in that the actual temperature, you've brought it down sort of quickly to a lower level temperature. Um, sadly though, it, the effect of temperature on bacterial growth is not an all or nothing thing. So. If you drop it, say, from 45 degrees to, say, 20 or 15 degrees centigrade, it just slows the rate of bacterial metabolism. So the doubling time might be, say, 30 minutes at, say, 42 degrees, and it might be an hour at 15 degrees. So if it's over a 24-hour period, even though you've dropped the temperature, you know, quickly, it's probably not going to um, do substantially much. But maybe one of the things that you can sort of try and do in terms of decreasing mould contamination in sort of bathrooms, etc., and in showers, is to actually ensure that uh, you know windows are open, a draft, decrease humidity, and hasten air drying. Or drying there. Yeah, or, or drying. Again, that can certainly help more quickly. But in the scheme of things, if you're looking over a 24-hour period, the fact that a shower might be completely dry within two hours versus you drying it within 15 minutes, when I don't want to sort of engender everybody going out and doing a lot of the work. And there are exceptions. I mean, my son's in our son's bathroom. I don't know what they do in there, but it seems to be hot and steamy for, you know, hours. So, you know, doors open, fans on, trying to sort of get it out, but they love hot showers. Yes? Um, you, just, you mentioned horses before. Um, yeah. Children with um, cystic fibrosis, um, I know some people that have got guinea pigs. Um, yeah. Is that, would that be a, a greater problem than that they have today? Uh, um, look, it, again, it sort of relates to, if you like, the, the density of exposure. If you sort of go to a, like a horse stable, you're going to be exposed with metres upon square metres of environment that's going to be sort of contaminated with hay and a whole range of other things. So the potential for significant exposure to high sort of particular counts of aspergillus and you know, environmental organisms is quite high. Versus sort of guinea pig cage, you know, relatively small, depending upon the frequency of how things are being changed. But I was thinking more that if, if then the children are picking, the, you know, picking them up and they're, they're doing Probably closer contact, you know. That's right, you know, guinea pigs spitting and coughing, etc. Again, there's just, we, we just don't have the data. And, uh, I mean, it really, look, I mean, tough, you know, life, I don't want to say life is tough, because life is tough, but uh, it's not made any easier when we can't really, you know, experts like me, Andre, we can't sort of provide guidance, we can't sort of go to PubMed and pull out, you know, advanced press from the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis you know, exploring, you know, see a frisk from guinea pig um, handling <laughs> in a hundred kids versus, you know, a hundred others. But I just never thought of it until you actually yeah. mentioned it. Yeah. The... So I guess that, that, that's good. So as long as one sort of thinks about it and adopts, you know, prudent, you know, risk management in terms of, you know, handling the excreta and the detritus on the bottom of cages. I mean, guinea pigs are incredibly lovely. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we hate to sort of deprive Kids of you know the sort of the advantage of pet ownership. Yes. <coughs> yes. Is there any research done on um, wool-based animals like dogs, uh, like poodles, sort of thing versus hair-based? Is there a difference uh, in dogs and cats? Not uh, well. Look, I have to be honest. I haven't specifically looked at that. Um, it could well be that the hair itself does change the microbial mix at the skin hair junction. We certainly know that dogs uh, carry staphylococci and some dogs carry staph aureus, um, human strains, and they're sort of postulated as being a potential mechanism of sort of a ping pong circle of infection colonization in patients that have got, say, the current staph aureus infection. But usually, um, you know, humans are humans and dogs are dogs and cats are cats. 
And usually the microbial communities that colonize animals tend to be sort of well adapted to that particular ecological niche. But um, a lot of people co-sleep with their dogs. Um, so it's not unusual for dogs to pick up human bugs and humans to pick up dog bugs. But specifically relating to fur and hair types, I um, haven't seen it. Yes, okay. Um, if uh, there are children in a school environment, if they're doing gardening, you know, potting mix or yeah. soil, um, should the child with cystic fibrosis wear a mask or should they not? Or even if they're doing gardening at home, yeah. what should they, what would be the best thing to do? Well, one of the things I'd be sort of wanting to think about is what is the length of time and the exact nature of their sort of their activity. Yeah. If they're going to see, let's say, be bogging around in mulch and dirt for, let's say, a fair amount of time, over 15 minutes, maybe half an hour, then you could sort of say, well, look, although there's a low risk of acquisition, the cumulative, you know, risk of them acquiring something, it, it could be there. Um, Certainly we know that there are particular scenarios where Legionella acquisition is quite high risk. Opening a sealed plastic bag of potting mix with that first slash of the knife is an absolute ballooning forth of heavily contaminated um, sort of particular matter. So that is one sort of area and then the subsequent sort of shaking out of the potting mix which could be a particular risk. But say a kid sort of, you know, mucking around with sort of a plastic, uh, you know, um, shovel and a little sort of, you know, bucket um, in a relatively dry or even sort of semi-moist environment for 15, 20 minutes, is there really going to be a significant advantage in wearing a mask? I guess it depends how well the kid can actually tolerate a mask. Um, that's the other thing, is the actual age. Yeah, but it's also being different to all the other things. Yeah, and, and you know, social stigmata and, you know, yeah. peer things. I mean, you know, kids can be the cruelest uh, humans out there in terms of how they can sort of, you know, manage other kids that seem different. So, I think it's fair to say, even though I'm sort of giving a particular view, that if you ask me, Tony, where is the hard evidence that wearing a mask is actually going to be significantly protective? I have to say there isn't any. So in that sense, when you sort of factor in, in a school environment, mask wearing, all the hassles, etc., trying to get sort of teachers on board, different versus, you know, non-different inclusion in your peer group, maybe, in fact, they shouldn't wear a mask. So, I, I just don't know. Yes? Uh, I've got uh, two questions. As you say, bugs are everywhere on surfaces and in the air. Uh, I've read some articles that uh, copper uh, surfaces will radically reduce yes. bacteria, and I'm wondering whether that would be an effective thing for like doorknobs or faucet handles that you've been talking about. My second question is, I've heard that putting toothbrushes in microwaves will knock out bacteria totally. Do, do both of these methods work? Okay. You're dead right with regard to sort of copper um, having antimicrobial activity as does sort of silver, etc. Um, the US government, I won't say it's DARPA, you know, that arm of US government that sort of examines all weird and wonderful stuff. But there certainly has been modelling about the role of copper containing door handles and doorknobs as a way at a community level to try and decrease the spread of potential pathogens. There is unequivocal data that sort of copper containing um, bench tops in the environment, in ICU environments, etc., leads to significantly reduced bacterial loads and we believe, but not yet shown, that that reduction of bacterial loads decreases risk of, you know, contamination and nosocomial infection. So yeah, definitely there is activity. It's significant activity, but is it significant enough to really impact upon um, your overall exposure to environments? I mean, just think how many sort of door knobs and handles you touch in a day. Might, might be 50 or 100. And then think of everything else that you touch. That's not copper, 
place to order them. In terms of the microwaving, it does have antimicrobial activity, but the, how it does that is by generating high temperatures in the water that's present. So it's the high temperature in the water gets up to 70 plus degrees centigrade and effectively it pasteurizes your toothbrush. If you had an absolutely dry toothbrush with bacteria present and microwaved it, um, you'd still recover those. Yes? Um, what about drinking water? Um, how, like I have a five year old and I give her a bottle of water going to school and then the teachers change it in the afternoon. What is like a, a safe time for a child to um, have water in a container? Um, well, first up, it really uh, depends upon where the water is being deprived, uh, sourced from. Okay, normal scheme water, usually at the faucet coming out, there should still be around about, you know, at least 0.5 to 1 part per million of the back of the chlorine. Okay. Depending upon, you know, Perth plumbing infrastructure, sometimes it can be less than that. So, but the bottom line is, is that normal scheme water will have back of chlorine in it. So if there are any bugs, they're usually present in very low levels and they sort of get bumped off. It'd be exceptional to find, you know, bacterial levels greater than sort of, you know, 100 CFU per mil um, in sort of drinking water. Now, if you're using rainwater, unpasteurised, not boiled, then rainwater tanks loaded with biofilms and they will have significant degree of bacterial contamination. But it might not all be bad. Because one of the things uh, I mentioned, uh, alluded to, is uh, ultraviolet light. And there's good work done in third world countries of trying to sort of purify contaminated water in these third world environments. And what they found is that two litre clear plastic Coke bottles, the polyethylene, still allows UV light in. So what you do is you put your two litres of contaminated water, close the lid and leave it in the sun. And after a day in the sun, the UV light effectively renders the water sterile. So, for example, if you had water in a bottle on a shelf exposed to sunlight, <coughs> there probably wouldn't be any, any risk at all. So, changing the water yeah. for the afternoon, probably no harm, but is there likely to be a real benefit in terms of a real quantifiable microbial risk? I'd say no. So, in terms of stagnant water, so what type of time scale are you talking about that, um, that microbials will grow? And uh, for, well, for sort of sterile water or water just in sort of a clean container, you'd, you'd be having to look at least at 24, 48 hours plus. Okay, because it is, it, although the pseudomonas will grow in it, I mean, it is a relatively hardy environment in terms of the actual quantum of nutrients that are present. I mean, it's still, Although pseudomonas will grow, or will not die, um, it's still relatively hardy. So you do need hours to days for it to grow. Yeah. I mean, I'd be quite happy. I don't have mean, cystic fibrosis, but for example, if the water bottle had been filled and hadn't been used, kept in the backpack for two days, three days, I think it would still pose really negligible if zero risk. Yes. About kitchen sponges. I just imagine that they're a little hotbed of bacteria, but how do you best manage that? Like, should you use a new one every day, or in the scheme of things, is it not really going to make a difference anyway? I'm terribly sorry, I just missed the first part of your question. Kitchen sponges. Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, being a man in the kitchen, if it fails the sniff <laughs> test, I just pour boiling water on the side. Um, and how, how, how long do you sort of take for that to get, look, I mean, you're right, kitchen sponges, um, well, in a sense, they're sort of, it's the perfect uh, matrix for, uh, you know, polymicrobial communities. Yes. You know, you're wiping up sort of, you know, raw food, veggies, you name it. One of the things I haven't addressed is the bacterial load of, um, uh, you know, peels, you know, on the outside, you know, cucumbers, you know, fruits, whatever. So, again, I think uh, you'd, you'd be ill-advised to miss out doing something about the sponge if you're expending a lot of energy in terms of wiping down sinks and benches and stuff. Uh, 
whether you sort of rotate sponges, my wife is a great believer in sponge rotation, <laughs> which I find particularly annoying because I have my favourite emo whatever mock-up it is, and that disappears, and I find it's been hanging up outside, getting buckets of UV sunlight and drying perfectly, but uh, then I've got to use something else. So I guess, again, how important it is, we don't really know, but it would seem prudent, you know, to at least sort of, you know, have some sort of, you know, sponge disinfection, whether it's just subjecting it to pasteurisation, putting it in a pot and pouring boiling water on it and letting it sit there, being mindful of scold um, damage to your child, you know? <laughs> um, that's probably sufficient. Have a couple of sponges that you rotate. Yes? How does it unbottle water, you know, like you know, Um, a lot would really depend upon uh, the, the sampling technology. Often those sort of bottles do go through an optical filtration process that actually removes, uh, you know, sort of viable bacterial counts. Um, often they don't sort of have adequate chlorine levels, so they do re rely on ultra filtration to have, uh, you know, essentially no bugs present. That said, well known, I mean, I don't know if people can remember, but in the 80s when it was, when I was sort of a young gener generation D or whatever, I can't remember now. But there was a vote for drinking lots of Perrier. Uh, and there was a massive contamination saga of, you know, Perrier bottled water. So, uh, yes, but I'm, I'm not up to the exact details, but I would be, like all of these sort of uh, commercial food products and contamination, at the end of the day, the reality is, is most of the Australian source stuff is produced to incredibly high food and microbial safety standards. And I would probably be happier drinking my, uh, you know, now Franklin, um, than a, having 600 mils of somebody's rainwater tank. Yes? That's a very quick one. Um, there's not really any way for us to test this ourselves, is there? We have a rainwater tank, or, you know, a water pool in our backyard, there's no way for us to see. Yeah. Uh, no, no, but, uh, but look, there are um, there are commercial microbial sampling laboratories that sort of undertake commercial processing and analysis of water and foods, etc. Um, whether you having the analysis done is going to be really materially significant, possibly not. What I would do is get onto the web. South Australian Public Health uh, sites, uh, their water site uh, has got really good advice for homeowners maintaining, uh, you know, rainwater tanks and the things you need to watch out for in terms of, you know, adequate filtration, first rain of the season bypassing the rainwater tank. So a lot of the debris and stuff that's on your roof doesn't actually go into the tank first up, but subsequent washes do. That sort of stuff, I think, is probably far more important. Yes. Like we've got a rainwater tank, that's, we don't have any steam on it, but we've got um, a UV filter installed yeah. on the tank, so that, that's a pretty good measure. Yeah. 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 yeah, definitely. Yes. Sorry. Um, on the line the other day, I saw a hand sanitizer <coughs> yep. that lasted 24 hours. Okay. Have you heard of that? Is it effective? Or? Yeah. Um, in short, hand sanitizer products, there's a whole range of different stuff. Um, basically, it can be divided into two classes, alcohol-based and non-alcohol-based. And the non-alcohol-based ones, the critical component is chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine is an antibacterial, mainly against gram-positive organisms. Uh, it tends not to have much activity against gram-negative organisms. The chlorhexidine binds to proteins within skin cells. So you put on your application of chlorhexidine and then you'll wash it off after, say, 60 second contact time. And there's bound chlorhexidine that continues to exert local antimicrobial activity for up to 24 hours. The alcohol preparations, though, have got a far greater kill rate. Right? You know, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, you know, knock off. So you can have a million bucks, 15 seconds of alcohol, you'll be down to 100 bucks. But it's a short term thing. Once the alcohol goes, any bugs that are there will remain there, potentially increase. 
But again, like with all hand hygiene, um, it's decreasing your bacterial load. So normal hand hygiene, soap and water, is actually quite good in terms of decreasing the bacterial load. Hand sanitizers give you that little bit extra. Is that going to be important in a CF home environment? Possibly, possibly so. Um, is it important in a hospital environment? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's basically where hand sanitizers are. Um, ADO doesn't use obviously any chemicals in the products, but the surface is, is different from an attraction perspective. Does that have benefit or, or not? Sorry, the, the first word? Enyo. Enyo. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going, not getting tired. I just don't know the answer. <laughs> I have to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, Enyo and other microfiber particle type technology is sort of quite interesting in terms of interactions with surfaces and bacteria. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's some, there is some effect. It's just I'm not aware of any studies that have directly examined it. Yes? I'm often feel anxious about the fact that obviously what, when the drinking water comes out of the tap, the, you know, the bit that it comes out of is always wet. Um, yeah. You know, and that's the only Well, I, I think you're right that whatever is in there, and a shower head would be a good example, you know, especially flexible sort of shower head where you've got from sort of the wall out of it to the actual shower rose. You know, you could have 50, 100 mils of water in there that is sort of being relatively stagnant. So in that sense, it would seem to make good sense to turn on the tap, point the shower hose or the faucet away so you don't sort of face with aerosols being generated, let it run, any of the free bacteria that's been present, uh, present in the water from the biofilm that definitely coats the insides of these things will have sort of, you know, gone. Running hot water through? Um, probably not. I mean, it would have a small effect, but you really need to get up to sort of, you know, pasteurisation temperatures, and then you start, depending upon how hot you have your hot water, you then sort of, you know, run sort of thermal injury risks and is it going to have a big effect in terms of decreasing bacterial numbers? Probably not. But there, I think there is a basis for, you know, running um, systems where there's been the potential for cooling of stagnant water for a brief period of time to sort of get, you know, the bacterial stuff that might be sort of there in a reasonably significant load out of, out of the way. Would you ever recommend boiling drinking um, Out of the tap? No. Uh, yeah, one, maybe one last question. Look, I'm conscious that I've been rabbiting on here for a while and we have got other speakers, so yeah, far away. I was just thinking about, um, we've got like an under sink water filtration system that goes through cartridges. Is that more of a risk, less of a risk? Yeah. <laughs> they say they come out at the other end with less bacteria. Yeah, yeah, no, so look, I'm and... But are they coming out with the right bacteria and the wrong um, bacteria? Who knows what? And it's a matter of some, uh, some degree of closeness to my own heart. Because I had a microbiological laboratory and we use buckets of water. But we don't use tap water. We use water that's been through multiple sort of, you know, filtration canisters. Yeah. Um, now, as part of that, the end unit is a filtration unit that sort of knocks off and, you know, removes, you know, bacteria, sort of, you know, greater than 0.2 micron. So the water that we get out of those systems is, is sort of quite clean and pure. Whether or not a home filtration system, um, where you might only be using one particular filter canister, or possibly two, and probably not using a filtration canister that's actually got a microbial filter built in, so it'll remove uh, contaminants, etc., like charcoal absorption and stuff like that. Whether that's going to 
um, have a significant effect on microbial counts? Possibly not. There is some data that some of these filtration canister systems, if used beyond their normal service life, they themselves become heavily bacterially contaminated with slime and therefore could actually increase your risk. So I think you've really got to look at the individual system that you're using and whether or not it incorporates a filtration canister at the end and also the service life of the canisters that you're using to maintain, you know, replace them at the regular service intervals. Look, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. A wealth of knowledge and experience. And uh, maybe um, at the end, if you still have some more pressing questions, um, Tony and Andre will still be around. But if we take a um, quick morning break, or well, just maybe five minutes, because we've got Crystal 